shall see his face, face, when it's all over, when it's all over, I'm going to put on my story how I made it over I'm going to put on my robe tell the story how I made it over I'm going to put on my Search me and try me, Master, today, brighter than snow, Lord, wash me just now.
Good morning, and thank you for joining us in worship. I'm Bishop Mary Ann Buddy, and on behalf of Dean Hollerith and all of us at Washington National Cathedral, I welcome you. As we begin now, a new season in the Christian life, with this the first Sunday in Advent, a time of anticipation and preparation leading up to the celebration of Christmas, Jesus being born among us in human form. We're honored this morning to welcome back Pastor Adam Hamilton from Church of the Resurrection in Leewood, Kansas, one of the most spirit-filled and socially engaged churches in the country and the largest United Methodist church in the world. Adam Hamilton is the founding pastor of Church of the Resurrection, and he first preached here at Washington National Cathedral during President Obama's second inaugural prayer service in 2012, and I have been learning from his leadership ever since. He came back in 2018 to teach us on how to live unafraid with courage and hope in uncertain times, and today he will speak to us on the subject of his most recent and timely book, Incarnation, Rediscovering the Meaning of Christmas. Washington National Cathedral is planning a number of Advent and Christmas offerings, and I've been asked to take, take a moment to walk you through them and teach you how you can learn more about them so you don't miss any of the ones through which God may speak to you in this holy season. So if you're watching online, I would ask you if you would to open up a new tab in your browser. And I'll wait just a moment. And when you do, if you could type in cathedral.org backslash Christmas. And if you're not near a computer, you might write that down. I'll say it again. Cathedral.org backslash Christmas. Now, if you would do two things. In the chat during worship today, if you could tell us which of these offerings speak to you, that you don't want to miss or that you might share with another. And after worship today, if you would be so kind as to register on the link there, it's free and it will give you an opportunity to receive notices from us each day of the offerings that are coming ahead. And there's also a chance if you like to donate to help make those services possible. Now, thank you for your attention. If you allow us to engage with you this way, um, you just register and we will we'll take care of the rest. So now, deep breath everyone. If you are at home near a candle, you might light it as we prepare to worship. Welcome into this holy space at the beginning of this holy season. and speak together. God the Lord has opened a door. Son of Mary, Hey, 
Listen thou to help me. Thou Christ of hope, thou door of joy, golden sun of hill and mountain. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe. You call all nations to walk in your light and to seek your ways of justice and peace. For the night is past, and the dawn of your coming is near. As the first candle of this wreath has been lit, Bless us and rouse us from sleep that we may be ready to greet our Lord when he comes, for he is our light and our salvation. Blessed be God forever. Amen.
Blessed are you, holy and living one. You come to your people and set them free. Praying together, Almighty God, to you our hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now in this time of our mortal life in which your son Jesus Christ came to visit us in great humility that in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned, because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Hear, O 
old shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock. Shine forth, you that are enthroned upon the cherubim. In his presence of ye from Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your strength and come to help us. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. of host, how long will you be angered despite the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have given them bowls of tears to drink. You have made us the derision of your neighbors. And our enemies laugh us to scorn. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us,
Santo Evangelio de nuestro Señor Jesucristo, según Marcos. Jesús dijo, en aquellos días, pasado el tiempo de sufrimiento, el sol se oscurecerá, la luna dejará de dar su luz, las estrellas caerán del cielo y las fuerzas celestiales temblarán. Entonces se verá el Hijo del Hombre venir en las nubes con gran poder y gloria. Él mandará a los ángeles y reunirá a sus escogidos de los cuatro puntos cardinales, desde el último rincón de la tierra hasta el último rincón del cielo. Aprendan esta enseñanza de la higuera. Cuando sus ramas se ponen tiernas y brotan sus hojas, se dan cuenta ustedes de que ya el verano está cerca. De la misma manera, cuando vean que suceden estas cosas, sepan que el Hijo del Hombre ya está a la puerta. Les aseguro que todo esto sucederá antes que muera la gente de este tiempo. El cielo y la tierra dejarán de existir, pero mis palabras no dejarán de cumplirse. Pero en cuanto al día y la hora, nadie lo sabe, ni aun los ángeles del cielo, ni el Hijo. Solamente lo sabe el Padre. Por lo tanto, manténganse ustedes despiertos y vigilantes porque no saben cuándo llegará el momento. Deben hacer como en el caso de un hombre, que estando a punto de irse a otro país, encargó a sus criados que le cuidaran la casa. A cada cual le dejó un trabajo y ordenó al portero que vigilara. Manténganse ustedes despiertos, porque no saben cuándo va a llegar el señor de la casa, si al anochecer, a la medianoche, el canto del gallo o a la mañana. No sea que venga de repente y los encuentre durmiendo. Lo que les digo a ustedes, se lo digo a todos. Manténganse despiertos. Jesus said, In those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. 
from the fig tree learn its lesson. So soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord God. Today, thanks to the gift of technology and the necessities of COVID, I'm having a chance to preach in two places at the same time. I'm thrilled to be joining the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. It's a privilege to be preaching with you today. And I'm coming to you from Church of the Resurrection Sanctuary in, the, in Leewood, Kansas, a suburb of Kansas City, and uh, sharing with our congregation as well. So simultaneously preaching to two congregations. And uh, Church of the Resurrection, like the National Cathedral, uh, there is no one in our building right now, just a handful of people helping with the recording of this service. It's an honor to be sharing the word with you, and I'm coming to you from Church of the Resurrection Sanctuary, and, I, and uh, like you, Bishop Buddy, I'm uh, speaking to an empty room, and uh, it's part of how we do worship during the COVID days, but we're coming to thousands and thousands of people online, and it's a joy to have our two congregations worshiping together today. Thank you for allowing me to be with you, and, uh, and I'm excited for us to share together in the service of worship on the very first weekend of Advent. So as we do that, I want to just mention a couple of things. This uh, sermon series at Resurrection, so Resurrection, this month we're not using the lectionary. We're focusing on, the th on a theme called Incarnation, Rediscovering the Significance of Christmas. And each week we're looking at the various titles that were given to Jesus by the gospel writers in the accounts of the Nativity. So in Matthew and Luke's account of the birth of Christ and the events surrounding it, and in John's prologue to the gospel in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, and we're seeing what are these titles that were given to Jesus by the gospel writers or by the angels or by the people in the stories. And then what do those, what do those titles tell us about the one whose birth we're celebrating and the one we anticipate returning once again at the end of the age? What do they tell us about him? And then what do they tell us about ourselves? How did Jesus incarnate these ideas? And then how does he call us to incarnate these ideas in our own lives and in the world around us. So that's where we're heading this month. I'll just mention to you, just in case you're curious, where we're heading here at Resurrection the next few weeks. We're gonna talk about today, Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah. Next week, Jesus is Savior. The third week, Jesus is Emmanuel. The fourth week, we're gonna talk about Jesus is the Word made flesh. On Christmas Eve, we'll talk about Jesus is the light of the world. And on the Sunday after Christmas, we're gonna talk about Jesus as Lord. All of these are titles you find in the gospel stories surrounding the birth of Jesus. Today, we're gonna to focus on this idea of Jesus as the Christ or the Messiah. And we're gonna unpack this. We're gonna to try to understand what does that title mean? It appears more than 500 times throughout the entire New Testament. So it's pretty important to know <clears throat> what did the early Christians believe when they called Jesus the Christ? And Jesus Christ, that Christ is not his last name. It actually is a title and it has an interesting history and an interesting meaning. So I wanna tell you a little bit about that. Uh, I'll just remind you, 
Christ comes from the Greek Christos. In Hebrew, the, the same word in the Hebrew language is Mashiach or Messiah. So Christ and Messiah mean the same thing. These are titles for Jesus and they mean the anointed one or actually one that has been anointed. It's a noun and it describes a person or an object that has been anointed. So when something was anointed, oil was smeared upon it uh, with a thumb or a finger. It was smeared upon the object or the person or oil was poured upon their head. And so... Uh, so this is an interesting title for Jesus. Jesus is the one who had oil smeared on him. But there's far more to it than that. So let's just unpack a little bit of the history of this word, and then we'll begin to understand what it might mean for us today. So uh, in the book of Exodus, we read that God tells Moses to create an oil, a scented oil, and then he is to use it to anoint the objects that were used in worship in the, in the tabernacle, the, the portable temple. He was then to use that same oil to anoint the people that would become priests, Aaron and his sons. And uh, later on, the same, the same kind of oil was going to be used to anoint uh, people to be king over Israel. Not Moses wouldn't do this, but uh, Samuel would be the first to do this with Saul and then with David. But when somebody became king, they were anointed. Now, here's what the anointing oil meant. It meant, uh, this was God's way of saying, this person or this object belongs to me. This person or object is sacred to me. It's set apart for my purposes. It is holy unto me. It's consecrated for my work. And so that could be true of, of objects, it could be true of people. I'm standing here above our baptismal font at Church of the Resurrection Sanctuary, and I can still see the sign of the cross, you can barely make it out, in oil on the limestone when Bishop Rubin's signs uh, anointed this, this font, when he actually consecrated it uh, three years ago when our sanctuary was built. And he placed the oil on there as a way of saying, this font belongs to God, and it's to be set aside for God's purposes. He did the same thing, Bishop Signs did the same thing in, on our altar behind me. Uh, when people are, are ordained, they have oil placed upon them. In most traditions, oil placed upon them, and the bishop lays their hands on them, and they are consecrated or ordained for God's purposes. When somebody is baptized, we put oil on their head, and we invoke the Holy Spirit, and we say, this child or this adult is set apart for God's purpose, belongs to God, is sacred to God. And, and when we confirm, we do the same thing. When somebody is sick, we anoint with oil, and that oil is both a sign of the balm of Gilead, the healing of God, the Holy Spirit's presence, but also a reminder to the one who is sick, you belong to God, you are holy to God, you are God's, and may God somehow, God didn't cause this sickness, but may God use it somehow to accomplish God's purposes. And then when somebody approaches death, and I've done this many times with people in our congregation who are dying, I take the oil, I make the sign of the cross upon their forehead, and I give them to Jesus. And once more, I remind them, you belong to him. You are sacred to him. You, you, are, you are his child, and he's gonna hold you from this life to the next. He's got a hold of you and won't let you go. Anointing, it's a very powerful idea. Now, as I mentioned, the kings were anointed with oil. So as they were anointed with oil, this was very important. The king was meant to understand you rule at the pleasure of God. God is the king of the universe, our Jewish friends say. And so when we think about him as the king of the universe or the ruler of all creation, then when God allows somebody to rule as king when he chooses them to be king or when he allows somebody to rule as, as president or whatever the position might be in our world today, God is saying, I'm, I'm lending some of my authority to you. Now, now, you belong to me. You're meant to accomplish my purposes. I mean, that was the idea behind anointing somebody with oil. And over the centuries in Judaism, when, when the Jewish people would no longer be ruled by their own kings, when there would be nations that would destroy them, or there would be kings, foreign kings ruling over them, or they'd be taken off into bondage and exile, the prophets would speak and they would say, but the day is going to come where God's going to raise up another king. And they would paint a picture of this ideal king. He would rule with righteousness and with justice. And he would be a shepherd over God's people. And, and as he shepherded them, he would, he would bind up the wounded. He would search for the strays and bring back the lost. This is what the ideal king would look like. And the people began to long for that. Sometimes they had their own kings, but they didn't measure up to this. And they kept praying and longing for a king that God would raise up who would, who would be like this ideal king the prophet spoke about. And that takes us to the time of Jesus. And in this time, of course, the Romans ruled over the, the Holy Land, the Promised Land, and their client king was Herod the Great. Herod the Great was no Messiah. He was no anointed one. He didn't, he didn't live up to the great ideals that the prophets had laid out, neither did the emperor in Rome. And so the people were longing, waiting, hoping for the coming of this anointed one, this king. So when we talk about Jesus as the Christ, the term 500 times in the New Testament refers to the fact that he is the ruler who was promised of old. He is the one who would rule and reign after God's own heart. And, and when we look at him, we recognize that Christians don't simply believe that Jesus was sent by God like any other person to be a king, but that he actually incarnated God's presence. He embodied God's presence in our world with us. That's a mystery we can't fully explain. But the fact that God came to us in Jesus, born in Bethlehem as a babe, grew up to be a man who suffered and died for us and was raised to life 
in order to show us who God is and who we are called to be and what it means to be human and to redeem and save this broken world. That's who Jesus is. That's our king. Now, at Advent, of course, we're preparing ourselves to rightly celebrate his birth and to remember something about his story and, and, and to remember the longing of the prophets and the, and the words that they spoke about what this king would be like and, and to remember once more why we need him. So this whole season, this whole month is about yearning and longing and remembering and, and so we can rightly celebrate, you know, we can really fully remember the significance of Christmas. But we're also remembering that Jesus said he would come back one day. He would come back at the end of the age. And so we anticipate that. And, and if it's not the end of the age, it certainly will be at the end of our lives. So Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back for you. I love that. He doesn't say he'll send the angels. He says, I will come back for you. His second advent may very well be when he comes back for you and when he comes back for me. And I want to be ready for that. And I want you to be ready for that moment where when he looks at you and he welcomes you into his eternal kingdom, he can say to you and say to me, you know, I think you got it right. I'm really grateful for the ways that you sought to serve me. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Now, I want us to think carefully about what we find in the scriptures about Jesus as the Christ. So uh, remember, of course, that the, uh, that the first verse in Matthew's gospel names Jesus as the Christ. The first verse, I believe, in Mark's gospel names Jesus as the Christ. When we get to Luke's gospel, we read on the night when the angel, on the night Jesus was born, the angel shows up to the shepherds, keeping watch over their flock by night. And this is what he says. Don't be afraid. Look, I bring you good news. I bring good news to you. Wonderful, joyous news for all people. Your Savior is born today in David's city. He is Christ the Lord. When the angel Gabriel came to Mary six or nine months earlier, when he, when he appeared to her at the Annunciation, he, he told her that she was going to give birth to a child. And then this is what he says about that child. He says, he will rule on the throne of his ancestor, David. You remember when the Magi came after Jesus was born? They came from Persia and they brought their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They show up in Jerusalem trying to find this child. And you remember the question they ask? Where is he who is born King of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to pay him homage. Nathaniel, when Jesus began his public ministry, Jesus begins to speak to him as teaching Nathaniel. And, and Nathaniel says this, he says, you are the king of Israel. You, you may remember, of course, when Jesus is in the midst of his ministry and he takes the disciples up to the north. And, uh, and when he's up by, by the, in the northern area at Caesarea or near Caesarea uh, Philippi, uh, he turns to the disciples, he says, who do you say that I am? You know, I know what the crowds say, but who do you say that I am? And do you remember? Only Peter had the courage to speak up. And he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You're the anointed one, the long-awaited king who is to come. That's who we believe you are. As Jesus rode into uh, Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, you remember he mounted a donkey. And people recognized that as a sign from the prophet Zechariah who said, behold, your king comes to you riding on a donkey. And so they began to throw their cloaks down before him and they wave their, their palm branches or their, or their leafy branches. And they began to shout out, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus, that week, uh, that the end of that week, he's on Thursday, Monday, Thursday, he's celebrating the Last Supper with his disciples. He's eating the Passover Seder with his disciples. And you remember what his disciples are arguing about? Which one of us is going to sit next to him when he comes into his kingdom? Right? And, and then Pontius Pilate, after he's arrested, you remember the question he asks? Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus' response, it is, as you say, a kind of cryptic response. When Jesus is crucified, you remember, he's already been anointed, not by the high priest, but by three different women in the Gospels, one of whom was known as the sinful woman of the town. And these are the people that anointed Jesus. When, when he's coronated, you remember the Roman soldiers take a crown of thorns and they place it upon his brow. They, they, they install him on his throne by hanging him on a cross. And you remember the sign above his head? Jesus of Nazareth, what? King of the Jews. All right, that's our king. When we look at this story, that is our king. You remember the New Testament throughout the epistles, the, the, the name that's most commonly used for Jesus by Paul is he's the Christ, right? Or Lord is the other one, Christ or Lord. And when you get to the very end of the New Testament, you get to the book of Revelation and, and this, this final scene in Revelation sees Jesus. He's got a crown upon his, heads, upon his head and, and it's said that he had written on his thigh, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's our king. Now, it's interesting as we're in the season of Advent that we're thinking about uh, Jesus as king on this first weekend of Advent against the backdrop of an election, right? A very divisive election, a polarizing election. That, that's the way they've been for years, but, but even worse this year. 
And, and if you had the opportunity to go to someone's house for Thanksgiving, you may have stayed away from conversations about politics unless you agree. And, and actually for many people, it was a blessing that they socially distanced at Thanksgiving so they didn't have to talk about politics because this has divided communities, it's divided, uh, it's divided churches, faith communities, Sunday school classes, where people no longer will talk to each other because they held differing views, supported different candidates for the office of president and, and families who are divided. I've, I've talked to people who, who won't even talk to their family members or whose family members won't talk to them anymore because of who they supported in the election. This passion and the division in our country was seen in the amazing response to the election, the number of people who came out to vote so we set records, as you may know, 156 million Americans voted last time I checked. That was 65.4% of eligible voters. We haven't seen that kind of uh, election uh, results, the number of people voting among the eligible, 65.4% since 1908. You know, people came out in mass numbers voting for their candidate. And, and part of what we saw in those numbers, uh, we saw President Trump had 10 million more votes than he had uh, four years ago, 10 million more votes, and yet he still lost the election. There were people who came out who didn't come out before to support him. And then there were lots and lots of people who came out over 80 million, 74 million, around 74 million for President Trump, uh, just over 80 million for, for President-elect Biden who came out. And they were determined to not have him as their president. Some came out determined to have him. Some came out determined not to have him, but instead to have President-elect Biden. I mean, this is the kind of, you know, passion and anger and angst and frustration and fear that generates so many people coming out to vote in this election. Even now, CNBC change research poll uh, found that 73% of President Trump's voters believe he actually won the election. Right? That's really hard when a large number of people believe that, that the person who didn't win did win. And 81% of President Trump's supporters they surveyed said that they wouldn't give President-elect Biden a chance. And how do we move forward as a country like that? But before the Democrats start pointing fingers at Republicans, I'm pretty sure the numbers weren't too different four years ago when President Trump was elected and uh, Hillary Clinton was not elected. I'm pretty sure a lot of those Clinton voters said, I'm never gonna give this guy a chance and believe that he didn't rightfully win the election. I mean, you know, it's just interesting how, how, how divided we are as a country. And in the end, the brokenness that brings, the pain that brings to families, communities, the inability to solve problems and the opportunity for pain and brokenness and evil to fester in our midst. As I was reading the Gospels during this election, there were several things that stood out to me. So uh, it, it's interesting when every single day the top story on the news, or, or almost every day the top story on the news is the elections, you start thinking about everything in these terms. So I was reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John this year, and as I was reading the Gospels, what struck me is that Jesus' ministry looked very much like a campaign, right? He, he was coming and he knew that he was king. Uh, he saw himself as the Christ, I believe. And, uh, and his disciples saw him that way, so his campaign finance team were a group of women who funded the campaign, right? Uh, the, although the one man was the treasurer, that was Judas Iscariot who was stealing from the kitty. Th then we have, uh, after that, his, his campaign officers, and those were the 12 disciples. And you remember they were jockeying for position, wondering which one of them would get to serve on what part of his cabinet once he became king. That's what they were all anticipating. Right? And, and so Jesus comes and, and he begins to speak and he's giving these campaign rallies with thousands of people who are showing up. And as he's preaching and teaching at these campaign rallies, what he's laying out is his platform, his vision for what the kingdom, well, he called it the kingdom of God, what the world should look like. And that he said was the reign of God, the kingdom of God. And, and so he lays this out and he begins preaching and teaching this. If you wanna know what his platform looked like, look at the Sermon on the Mount where he lays this out clearly. You know, the first two, portions of that are, we need to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we love our neighbors, we love ourselves, and then that included even loving your enemies. And then again, in the Sermon on the Mount, we find things like the call to, to be honest, and to be faithful, and to be humble, and to be selfless, and to forgive other people. I mean, all of these are sort of the, the principal virtues of the kingdom, and, and they're at center of how he would run the country, right? How he would rule the world is in these ways, with these values. Then he illustrates those values. He, he sort of makes, you know, puts flesh on them by telling stories. He tells parables. And, and so when he's telling the parables, he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. He says, listen, this is what my kingdom looks like if it's, if it's realized here. Uh, and he talks about a man who sees somebody who's left for dead on the side of the road. And, he, and, and even though they're, they're, they're not blood brothers, one's a Samaritan, one's a Jew, he stops to help. And he takes off his cloak and he pays for his medical treatment and, and provides for him. Right? He says, that's what it's supposed to look like. And then he tells the parable of the sheep and the goats. And, and you know the story. He talks about at the last day, this is how judgment's going to go down. And, and God's going to bless those who fed the hungry 
who gave drink to the thirsty, who clothed the naked, who welcomed the foreigner, those who visited the prisons and cared for the prisoners and those who cared for the sick. Right? These are core values of the kingdom. And Jesus is saying, this is what I'm expecting of you. This is what, I've, this is what you're gonna be held accountable to at the last judgment. Right? So Jesus comes and he preaches this way. He teaches this way. He lives this way. So what struck me was, you know, Advent coming three to four weeks after the election, every presidential election, Advent comes three or four weeks afterwards. And I wondered, is it possible that Advent comes at this time and that that is providential? 75% of Americans claim to be Christians, claim to be followers of the Christ, the anointed one. And as followers of Christ, what would happen if we actually looked to Jesus and his values and virtues as the driving force in our lives? What if the 75% of us, Republicans and Democrats and Independents, Green Party and whatever else, what if we all said, you know what, there, we had different candidates for the presidency, but we have one king. And because you share the same king as I share, we are brothers and sisters. And we're going to try to live according to his values and figure out it within our own political ideologies. How do we live into these values? How do we become the people he wants us to be? Because that is our king. The day after the inauguration, every four years, the National Cathedral hosts a service called the inaugural service, the National Inaugural Service or the National Prayer Service. And uh, George Washington started this, not at the National Cathedral, it didn't exist then, but George Washington instituted this on his first full day in office where he wanted the clergy to pray for him. He wanted the prayers of the nation. And, and then it, most of the presidents since then have done this. Since 1933, every president has participated in the National Inaugural Service, and most of those have done this at the National Cathedral. I had the privilege of preaching one of those services for President Obama in his second inauguration, the only time I preached from your pulpit at the National Cathedral. And, and here's what I was thinking to myself. You know, all of these pastors and leaders have come. There's, there's the president and the, and the first lady and the vice president and, and his wife. There are, uh, there are Supreme Court justices and Congress people and all of these, you know, leaders of our, of our country. And I'd spent hours rewriting this sermon over and over again. And all I could think of was, God, what do you want to say to this man as he steps into this role once more for four more years. And inside what I longed for, and, and I think what we were praying for, you know, as, as people who were gathered there, was that he might rule, that he might preside, understanding that his authority ultimately came from God and from the people, but ultimately God has allowed him in this role, and that he might seek to live the virtues and the values that Jesus espoused when he talked about the kingdom of God. And I think probably everyone who's ever prayed for a president and, and given the message at one of those was longing for, hoping that that would happen. This is what I long for for our next president, that as he goes to that service, the National Cathedral, he will walk out saying, I desperately want to live these values and virtues that have shaped my life. And then they might set the pace for all the rest of us. Now, presidents are not perfect. They're human beings, fallible, faulty human beings. They don't have it all figured out. They don't have it all right. They need our prayers. They need our help. Sometimes they need our encouragement. Sometimes they need our criticism. But their job is to preside, to rule, to lead on behalf of the king of kings, the ruler of the universe. That's how I see it. All right, so with that in mind, I, I want to wrap this up by saying on this first weekend of Advent that, um, that Jesus is meant to be our king, our ruler, our sovereign Right? And, and we're preparing to celebrate his birth and we're anticipating his coming again. And, and as, I, as I want to leave you, I, I, want to, I want to leave you with the message, a sermon that was preached by a man named S.M. Lockridge. S.M. Lockridge was a very famous preacher in the, tw in the 20th century. Uh, he was uh, led an African-American congregation, was a uh, missionary and evangelist. He loved leading people to follow Jesus Christ, but he was also a civil rights leader and was passionate about racial justice. And he preached a sermon in his life that was called, his title for it was Amen. And it was preached, it was an hour-long sermon, it was preached across the country, and uh, his most famous sermon, and the last six minutes really redefined what that sermon was about. It was what people were longing to hear, and, uh, and gave it the popular name, That's My King. We've taken a couple minutes from that sermon, and I want you to hear it, and I want you to listen to his question. Take a listen. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords.
Ghost. That's my king. I, I wonder, do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the aged. He rewards the diligent, and he beautifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his light is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Uh, I wish I could describe him to you. Yes, he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your hand. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! That's my king. That's my king. That's my king. And I wonder, do you know him? I wake up every morning, I get on my knees, and I say once more, Jesus, here I am. I've been doing this since I was 14 years old. Here I am, Jesus. I want to follow you today. I want to live for you. I want to honor you. I want to be used by you. I belong to you. Help me to live up to that. And as we begin this season of Advent, that's my invitation for you today, for you to be able to say, that's my king. And I want to live what he believed. I want to follow him. I want to be used by him. I belong to him. Jesus said this in his first sermon found in Mark's gospel. He says, now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives. That is repent and trust this good news. Listen, as we're preparing our hearts for Christmas and for Christ's second coming, we all have a lot to repent for. Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Green Party, we've all blown it. We've made a mess of things. And it's time for us to repent of the brokenness in our own lives. It's time for us to remember the values of the kingdom and for us to live according to those and to say, that's my king. Would you bow in prayer with me? And while your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, wherever you are, I'd like to invite you just to whisper this prayer. Jesus, you're my king. Help me to follow you. Use me to accomplish your purposes. Help me to do your will. Guide me and lead me. Forgive me and heal me. I am yours. In your holy name, amen. The sculptor of the mountains, God the miller of the sand, God the jeweler of the heavens.
heavens, God the potter of the land. You are womb of all creation. We are formless, shape us now. God the new sends to the Pharaoh, God the cleaver of the sea, God the pillar of the darkness, God the beacon of the free. You are gate of all deliverance. We are sightless. Lead us now. God, the unexpected infant, God, the calm, determined youth. God, the table-turning prophet. God, the resurrected truth. You are present every moment. We are served. Meet us now. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Keeping awake as we watch for Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of promise, your reign has come near. Call your people to the way of repentance and inspire your church to bear fruit in the world through acts of faithful service. Hear us, O oh God, for your, for your mercy, mercy is great. The cathedral community gives thanks for the ministry of Canon Sam Van Keulen as he celebrates his 65th anniversary of ordination to the priesthood tomorrow. Hear us, O oh God, for your, for your mercy, mercy is great. God of the nations, 
Teach those with power and privilege to serve the vulnerable. Give to all leaders wisdom and understanding, counsel and truth, and a heart of compassion for the world you so love. Surround with your grace and protection Donald, President of the United States, and Joseph, President-elect, during this time of transition. We pray for a peaceful and stable transfer of power. Calm fears and guide our hearts that with civility we may live peaceably with one another. Hear us, O oh God, for your mercy is great. God of compassion, we pray for those who feel powerless and invisible as our nation faces the continuing challenges of the pandemic, economic distress, and racial injustice. Uplift their voices and ease their suffering in the coming days. Hear us, O oh God, for your, for your mercy, mercy is great. great. God of healing, uphold with the word of life all who suffer in body, mind, spirit, or relationship. With rising cases of COVID-19 across the nation and around the world, we pray for all suffering with the virus, that they may know your healing presence. We also pray for healthcare workers who risk their safety to provide medical care and compassionate support. Hear us, O oh God. For your, your mercy, mercy is great. God of hope, renew in your people a sense of your peace, especially those facing anxiety, depression, isolation, or alienation. Guide all people of faith to welcome one another as Christ has welcomed us. Hear us, O oh God. God of eternal life, you promise to take away our sins and gather us in your presence. We give thanks for those who now rest from their labors on earth, freed from pain and the power of death. Hear us, O God, for your mercy is great. Receive our prayers, faithful God, as we watch and wait for your coming among us. In Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. May God Almighty have mercy upon you forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. Thank you. Please be with you. Let's go. I'm Jan Cope, Provost of the Cathedral, and it's my joy to join along with Bishop Marianne and all of my Cathedral colleagues to thank you for choosing to worship with us this morning. You bless us in so many ways you can't possibly imagine. Particularly as our doors remain closed, you have opened your hearts and your spirit and your generosity to enable us to continue to reach out 
to be some of the light in the darkness to a hurting nation and world. And we need your help to do that. We have such a season ahead of us in Advent and Christmas, and we hope you will avail yourself of those different worship and learning opportunities. It is part of a gift that we enjoy together. So today, if after you have contributed to your own church community, you are able to support this, your national cathedral, we'd be profoundly grateful. Your support helps us to do the things that God has called us to do. So thank you and God bless you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in offering and sacrifice to God. to me abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth who shall stand when he appeareth But who may abide, but who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? And who shall stand? When he appeareth, 
for he is like a refiner's fire, for he is like a refiner's fire. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death and to make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days, you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him, you have redeemed us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me.
Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us in your son, to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where, with our patrons, the apostles Peter and Paul, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus, wisdom and mighty Lord, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. Jesus, true branch of Jesus' tree, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. Desire of nations are The gifts of God for the people of God. Let us join our voices in prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are truly present in the holy sacrament at the altar. I love you above all things and long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Let me never be separated from you. Amen.
Bright morning stars are rising. Bright morning stars are rising. Bright morning stars are rising. Day is a breaking in my soul. Oh, where are our dear fathers? Oh. Day is a breaking in my soul. Oh, where are our dear mothers? Oh. Shouting, day is a breaking in my soul. Bright morning stars are rising. Bright morning stars are rising. Bright morning stars are rising. Day is a breaking. Praying together, loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth a people forgiven, healed, renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Savior. May the sun of righteousness shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go with you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Expectation at midnight.
and Savior, go in the peace of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.